Okay, so it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Imelda Fitzgerald, who is a BSc midwife graduate of the School of Nursing and Midwifery in University College in York, uh, Cork, not York, Cork, <laughs> sorry, Imelda. Imelda okay. has completed her MSc in 2017 from that university and graduated as a midwife tutor from Trinity College Dublin in 2020. She's worked for many years in the Cork University Maternity Hospital. Within that time, Imelda observed women following a postpartum hemorrhage and they appeared to have additional needs and decided in 2020 to commence her PhD studies to develop a care pathway for women following a PhD, a PPH. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm making a disaster of this today. No, no, no. I shall leave a suitable space so that we can edit that out. Okay, so uh, my great pleasure to welcome Imelda Fitzgerald. Thank you, Linda. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's 11 o'clock here in Ireland, um, so you're all very welcome. Um, and thank you so much for joining in. Um, thank you, Linda, if you don't mind the next slide. So I just want to just acknowledge uh, my supervisors from um, University College Cork and also from the uh, National Epidem Epidemiology Perinatal Centre, which is one of the four national clinical audit centres in Ireland. Um, and just for, in comparison, the work that NPEC does could be kind of aligned with the work um, that is done with the Embrace reporting. So we look at similar statistics in relation to perinatal mortality and morbidity. So um, in my local hospital, I'd also like to thank our director of midwifery and the director in the Centre of Midwifery Education just for all their ongoing support. Thank you, Linda. So just to give a little bit of background um, into what it, postpartum hemorrhage is in Ireland. So PPH is the leading cause of maternal morbidity and mortality globally, and that's a WHO statistic. A woman is more likely to experience psychological and emotional distress um, following a, a postpartum hemorrhage. For the purpose of this research, um, the guidance of blood volume definitions that I'll be using are the Royal College of Gyne Gynecology guidelines. So a primary postpartum hemorrhage um, is 500 mils. And I'm going to further break that into a minor postpartum hemorrhage, can anything between 500 and 1,000 mils, moderate blood loss is 1,000 to 2,000 um, mils, and a severe postpartum hemorrhage is anything over 2,000 mils. It just adds to the context. And a major obstetric hemorrhage has been defined in the Irish National Clinical Guidelines as 2.5 litres or more. A severe postpartum hemorrhage is an obstetric emergency that needs immediate intervention and is the leading cause of maternal death. Ireland has the highest birth rate of the 28 EU countries at 12.9 live births per 1,000 people. Next slide, please, Linda. So I just have here is a, a representational graph and I've got this from my NPEC colleagues as well. So just would like to kind of focus on, on the red line. So the red line is the primary postpartum hemorrhage rate in Ireland over the last 17 years. And what we can see here is that it has risen. It's actually quadrupled in Ireland in the last 17 years from 2.5% in 2005 to the latest statistics we have at the moment of 2021, where it is 9.6%. The gold line underneath the red line um, is representation the, of the MOH uh, trends in Ireland. We only started to record them in Ireland in 2011, so that's why it starts there. And there has been an increase as well in that rate. The blue line is representation of the blood transfusion rates with women who have had postpartum hemorrhages, um, but that hasn't increased in line with the primary PPHs, and I won't be focusing on that today. Thank you, Linda. So I just want to mention a little bit about severe mortal morbidity as well. Um, so Severe maternal morbidity has become an important quality indicator for maternal warfare, welfare. For each woman who loses her life due to causes related to pregnancy, many more experience life-threatening conditions or long-term morbidities. Within maternity care, there is an increasing attention to listen to women in our services to improve their experiences, quality and safety. MOH is the most frequently reported SMM at 53.1%. So of all the complications women will face potentially after childbirth, 
MOH is the leading cause in that. The leading cause from MOH is uterine atony is the leading cause of why people are having postpartum hemorrhages. And it is most risk factor after having a cesarean section. Next slide, please, Linda. So I just wanted to provide a little bit of the background on the international data out there um, on what other countries are saying as well. So in uh, other countries, a lot of research out there, it focuses on how the woman felt about the event, whereas our research was a little bit different. So women would give their experiences of how they felt during the event. It, it, they described very accurately their feelings and their emotions. They spoke about the medical terminology they would hear during the event, uh, like hearing the word PPH or blood transfusions to people. That can be a very frightening and daunting experiences. Some of the women would speak about there was missed gaps in time where they kind of kind of had a foggy or a cloudy episode where they don't remember being told information. Sometimes people would hear gestures being mentioned. Um, for example, they might say, um, uh, oh, mom's well and baby's well, but they did not ask the woman if she's well or women have said, well, I'm alive and my baby's healthy. So that's all that really matters. Whereas we felt we need to do a little bit more research around this area because you know, we can't all say that all women are okay just because they didn't have um, a mortality associated with the, PP, the PPH. And a lot of descriptive um, from the women talking about their families and how their unit changed afterwards as well, how the dynamics change after experiencing a postpartum hemorrhage. Thank you, Linda. So for this research, um, it was conducted in a large uh, maternity hospital in the south of Ireland. And on average, the birth rate in this centre is 8,500 births. The maternity hospital itself is, a, is assigned to um, a, gener a larger general hospital so that we have shared um, services with the general um, centre if needs be. So we have a high dependency unit in our maternity hospital. Um, we take care of very sick and unwell women but if the woman is deteriorating uh, clinically she can be transferred to the general hospital ICU department. Within our maternity hospital we have several operating theatres and there's also a neonatal unit. Next slide please Linda. So the aim of this research uh, was to describe the informational needs of women in the postnatal period and the emotional support followed um, during a postpartum hemorrhage. The focus of this research was on the postnatal period. As I've mentioned, there are several, several published literature that describes the experience of PPH for women and how it can be a very frightening for them. Um, some of the women will spend time in the HDU and that can be a bit of a blur for women, but there is less awareness on how the woman feels after the postpartum hemorrhage in the postnatal period, in the short term and the long term. And that was the aim of our research. Thank you, Linda. Next slide, please. So I'm actually going to keep going, if you don't mind, so I'm going to speak about this all in my next slide. Thank you, Linda. Thank you very much. So what we did was we had a purposely selected sample. Um, our inclusion criteria was women who were over the age of 18. Um, they would have had to have had a postpartum hemorrhage of 2.5 litres or above, and they had to be admitted to the HDU. So what we did was that we went to our local HDU department, we looked through their admission notes, we identified the women who would fit the criteria, and then we reached out to those women. So here we have the five women who took part in the study. Their names have, uh, have been changed to protect their identity. And it just kind of gives you an overview of their demographics um, before they had their postpartum hemorrhage. What I would like to focus your attention to is the last box. Um, on the right hand side and it says the age of infant at time of the interview. So we conducted our research um, for any woman after the initial six week period. So once they were six weeks postpartum, we then reached out to the women. Um, so the women, the interviews were conducted in this study between four and 14 months postpartum. And from this, I'm going to recall all their experiences, but even 14 months postpartum, the women could remember exactly their birth story. Thank you, Linda. So just here is another recap of our inclusion criteria. And specifically, I'm just going to focus on our exclusion criteria. So we excluded anyone who their infant was, in, was related or was transferred to the neonatal unit. If the woman experienced an antipartial hemorrhage, if there was any fetal abnormalities, 
if the woman had a secondary postpartum hemorrhage versus a primary postpartum hemorrhage and if they ended up having a hysterectomy as well. Next slide, please, Linda. So the tool that we used to collect the data, so they were semi-structured interviews, face-to-face -face interviews. I interviewed the women and it was a two, it was an interview tool that had been previously used in another research area by Tessa Dunning in the UK. So it had that validity to the research tool. The previous research tool that we had used was used for women and their birth partners. So with consent, we adapted the, our research to focus on just the woman. Um, we didn't interview partners this time. So it became a 16 piece questionnaire and it was broken into six sections and it was their demographic details, birth experience and the postnatal period. Thank you, Linda. So how did we analyze this data? So it was a descriptive qualitative approach and I used the brawn and cloth thematic analysis. So we transcribed all the interviews that we did and we immersed ourselves in the, the different um, transcribes that were written there as well. We were looking for common themes. We were coding common words coming up throughout the analysis. Then we grouped them together and then we gave them headings. But we felt it was very important that we would uh, use the woman's words. So we used the woman, what she said to us in this research to really emphasize the importance of listening to women to change practice in the future. Thank you, Linda. So my four themes that were gathered from doing my thematic analysis was reflections of the event, information gap, perception of staff and improvements for practice. And I'm going to go through these more um, thoroughly in my next few slides. Thank you, Linda. So I'm actually going to call out to you what the women said to us um, uh, during their research, and then I'm going to give a synopsis of each one. So Sally mentioned, it was a very frightening experience where I had to distance myself from what was happening and tell myself, it's okay, it's okay. They know what they're doing. Claire, I didn't really realize that something had happened to me and that they're the reason, that was the reason why I was in the HDU. I thought it was because of the emergency cesarean section. The information I needed to reassure me was slow to be given. It trickled in from hearing the midwives hand over to each other. Those little bits of information were like little snippets. So you can hear here Sally describing the experience that she had. So she hadn't any control of what was going on around her, but she felt the control that she had was to disassociate herself from the situation, to calm herself down. She felt she wasn't getting that from the staff during the event. They were very task focused during the trying to manage the events around her. Nobody was speaking to her during the event. So she felt that she had to calm herself down because it was almost an out of body experience. Claire similarly found herself in HDU. That was the way she said it. I found myself in HDU and she believed that it was because she had a serine section. She didn't realize it was because she had had a postpartum hemorrhage of between 2.5 and 3 litres. And she overheard the healthcare professionals describing her care to, you know, to each other. And that's how she learned that she had had a postpartum hemorrhage. The women all agreed throughout this study that they may have been times where people were speaking to them about debriefing, but it was nothing that they could remember saying, yes, I got a debrief and this is what was said to me. It was a very foggy experience for them. So it kind of, you know, it's quite interesting to hear that and think, well, maybe we need other opportunities or other ways of saying it to the women, because maybe in the moment it's too much for them. They need the information, but maybe it's how we give that information. Thank you, Linda. Informational gaps. So this is Claire's uh, recollection on it. So the two bleeds that she had were due to what was called placenta abruption. And then I had another one due to uterine atony. And the only reason I knew what that was, those words, my husband is a doctor, so he was able to explain that to me. The information uh, was not in an ideal way that it was presented to me. Amy, I asked and the staff could only tell me what was on their sheets or handover notes. I don't know if they were told about it. They explained what Macodium grade 2 was. They didn't talk much about the bleed or anything to that. There wasn't too much information. So Claire felt that she was getting information about her event through her husband because he was a healthcare professional. He recognised the terminology that was being used and he was saying that to her um, as opposed to the healthcare professionals saying it to Claire in the way that she would understand it. 
Amy was reciting when she was back on the wards. So she has gone to HGU. She's been transferred up to the wards because she is now deemed uh, clinically well. But she's asking the postnatal midwives about her experience. Apologies. Um, and she's not getting that information that she needs. They're telling her what's in front of them of their handover notes. But because the midwives that at the time of the postnatal ward weren't at the postpartum hemorrhage or there may not have been much documentation or handover about the event, they are not able to give Amy that information that she needs to be able to mind herself better. So they could tell her factual things that were in on the handover now, but they couldn't tell her about the information that she wanted. Thank you very much. Perception of staff. So Veronica, um, I asked the staff on the ward what happened and they read my notes and said I was so lucky. Until that point, I didn't realise the seriousness of the bleed and I questioned, could I have died? Amy, I would get out of the bed and bring her, her baby, to bed and feed. I didn't know what I should be, if I should be ringing the midwife and the staff members. I didn't know what was normal or what was to a degree worse because of the bleed. Claire, I would get out of bed and bring her to bed to feed. And I like, I don't know, I should have been ringing the midwife, but I didn't know what was normal to a degree or what was, a, oh, apologies, that was actually, that one's recited, that's the wrong one. So the women could recall specific details about what they experienced and their feelings. Um, but they weren't, they, they felt the staff were very nice to them. The staff did what they could, but they felt like the staff were very busy on the unit. And what they wanted was more time with the women. They wanted more time to talk to the staff there to understand what was going on. They wanted more reassurances. Like Amy said there, she didn't understand what if she could get out of bed, if she couldn't get out of bed, could she mind her baby? Like she already had this doubt created. She was cared for so closely in the high dependency unit where it was one-to-one -one care then she was transferred up to the postnatal ward and all of a sudden she doesn't you know she's maybe in a private room she might be in a four-bedded room she could be even in a six or an eight-bedded room and she doesn't know what is normal or not normal or you know it creates this doubt of if she can care for her baby on her own because previous to this she's been in HDU and minded so closely thank you Linda So also the women were asked for their suggestions on how to improve future practice. So Sally said, I was so weak. I couldn't walk or do anything. I was terrified of looking after my baby on my own. I didn't know what was going on. I needed my mom, sister and partner to help me. So Sally's suggestion was that in the future, that if women experience a severe postpartum hemorrhage, that there should be additional circumstances where family a member of the family can come in to support them because maybe with staffing levels or maybe just that comfortable support that they need extra additional help in comparison to the woman who does not experience a postpartum hemorrhage. Veronica, if they had said you're going to need a lot of support, you're probably going to need to nap a lot and you're going to need someone to help you make food and assist you. You can forget about the washing. If something like that was said, it would have helped a lot. What Veronica has said is very basic information, but it's just to reassure the women and to tell them that what you've experienced isn't the normal and that you need to mind yourself by resting. You're going to need to get more support when you go home. If we don't say these words to the women, they may not know what to do or not to do and try to get on with normal life, doing everything themselves, but they're not allowing their body and themselves to recover. So it's about giving them more information that they can prepare themselves for when they're going home. Um, so the women, when they're transferred from the high dependency unit as well to the postnatal wards, they found that it was a very overwhelming experience to go from one-to-one -one care, close monitoring, up to a postnatal ward as well. So we also need to make improvements that we are telling our women that you are now transferred from a high dependency unit. You no longer require this one-to-one -one care. You are clinically safe. And to prepare them what they're going to see upstairs in the postnatal area, it is going to be a change of circumstances. Your care no longer needs us all the time. It kind of almost, you almost, I don't know if the right word is debrief, but you definitely would prepare the woman to the different circumstances so that she knows and she, we're giving the autonomy back to the woman to be able to care for her baby and to be able to still to reach out to the staff as well. The women also suggested as well that the community support. So 
the women felt if they went to their GP, their general practitioner or their public health nurse in the community, there was lots of information gaps there. The hospital were not telling the community of what had happened to the woman or the treatment they received. So when they get cared for in the community, the GPs are not aware, the public health nurses were not aware of what the woman went through. So they can't tailor their care or give them those additional needs. Sometimes it's too late. It might be two or three weeks down the line and the topic of a severe postpartum hemorrhage comes up. Whereas those crucial weeks, the woman needs more minding closer after they go home. Thank you, Linda. Next slide, please. So the women discuss a lot of their short term needs and, and their long term complications as well. Some were, were minor that they wanted some more information, you know, that they felt like they needed more support. But some were long term uh, issues as well. So a lot of the women, most of our women breastfed, four of the five were breastfeeding, but they felt that their breastfeeding journey, there were a lot more negative associations with it because they didn't realize that with a postpartum hemorrhage, Lack, delayed lactogenesis can occur. So they felt like, oh, I had a low milk supply. It took longer to feed my baby. I had to supplement my infant. When actually, if they understood that because of the severity of their bleed, it was going to cause their milk to come in longer, or it was going to take longer for their milk to come in, that the women could have done other things. We could have been double pumping. We could be hand expressing. You know, there could have been more time and support and education to the woman so that she then doesn't have any of this guilt or feel that it's a reflection on herself that her birth milk did and come in so and that then some of the women were breastfeeding for a period of time supplemented and end up formula feeding because they felt like they didn't have enough milk as opposed to the event causing their their supply to be temporarily um reduced there were unanswered questions so part of the ethics of this research the women um were all offered that if this because these questions could have evoked you know negative feelings so any woman who took part in this study was welcome to come back into the maternity hospital to have a full debrief by a consultant obstetrician and that is the way we do it in our maternity system so when we reached out to the five women one of them said rang me back and she said I'm happy to take part in this research it's very interesting but I would like to tell you I did not know I had a postpartum hemorrhage so she didn't know at the time of this research that she had had a postpartum hemorrhage but she wanted her experience to be known so that the system can hopefully adapt and improve for the future. So that woman was referred back in for a full debrief. A second woman was aware that she had had a postpartum hemorrhage, but still had a lot of questions 14 months after the event. So at the time, she did not want to be referred back into the maternity hospital, but we gave her the information. And when I spoke with the consultant obstetrician myself about this lady and that she would make contact in due time, but she wasn't ready at that time to process the information. But we gave her the pathway available to be able to come back into the service. As I've mentioned, the adjustment from HDU to the postnatal wards was huge for the women. So there needs to be a little um, body of work done there in our centre to improve that for our women. And the amount of additional support that they need about resting, about their dietary requirements, about the fact that breast milk might be delayed coming in, pain, infection. So what we've actually known is that our, because I've gone on further in my research now and I've interviewed midwives, there is no difference in the care, in the, the information that women get if they've had a postpartum hemorrhage or they don't have a postpartum. There is no standardized approach. So we need to tailor an information packet to women who have had a postpartum hemorrhage so that they can then, we are giving them, their, we're kind of putting the autonomy back in them. We're informing them with evidence-based care that they can provide best care for themselves and for their babies going home. Next slide, please. So this is my study at the moment, just in a quick um, recap there. So myself and the supervisors, we are trying to develop a care pathway for women after they have a, a primary postpartum hemorrhage and what this would be a standardised approach. And it's going to include her physical needs, her informational needs and it's her emotional needs. We're, we're thinking it might look like a little algorithm, it might be a checklist, but also it means that all women are offered the same care, whether they have minor, major or severe postpartum hemorrhages. It's something that can be tailored to each woman, but also it's going to help our staff because our staff will all be using a standardised approach to all women, irregardless if they're private or in the public sector getting care. So if they've paid for their maternity care or if they've not paid for their maternity care in Ireland, they're all getting the exact same care and they can they can tailor it depending on the woman and the blood loss 
Um, so it helps our staff as well that they're, they're t- there's no more guesswork. When do I take that hemoglobin follow up as well? Does this lady need to be debriefed? It kind of streamlines that care for them as well. And there has been positive feedback to the midwives that we have spoken to about this so far. Thank you, Linda. And I just want to mention that this um, publication has been accepted by the European Journal of Midwifery for publication, um, in case anybody would like to have a read of it. And I would welcome anyone if they have any questions. Thank you very much.